Job chapter 17 is where we pick it up tonight, having finished chapter 16 last time. Job is in the middle of answering Eliphaz's accusations against him. And again, the accusation is that Job must be a wicked man for him to be going through what it is that he is going through. Again, let me read to you from verse 1 of the entire book what God's assessment of Job was, lest we forget it, in the middle of um, the nonsensical counsel of his uh, friends. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. And so now he continues his defense against his people. He's called them, you know, miserable comforters, and he continues to build on that. Ending in chapter 16, fascinating. Half the time he wants to die to end the trial, and then the other half of the time he doesn't want to die before he's vindicated, you know, before these guys see that he's right and that what he's saying is right, that he's innocent of and it's not wickedness in his life that's caused him to be suffering these things. Chapter 17, verse 1. Job says, My spirit is broken. And the King James, I think it says, My, uh, my breath is, um, I can't, oh, my breath is corrupt. And of course, it's kind of the same thing. He's basically saying, I'm going to die. Um, sometimes when, you know, you're dealing with people who are uh, seriously terminally ill or sometimes where there's the eating disorder and the anorexia has gone, you know, to a certain level of things and the body begins to consume itself. Uh, the evidence that the body's in serious trouble will oftentimes come through the breath being bad. And, and so he's, he's physically, he's, he's failing uh, and he says, my spirit is broken or my breath is corrupt. My days are extinguished. The grave is ready for me. In other words, I'm as good as dead. He has no idea that he has a very long life that lays out ahead of him. But, you know, that's the trouble that he's in. And not only, you know, is he dying, not only is he in that terrible condition, but he says, are not mockers with me? And does not my eye dwell on their provocation? He looks at his comforters and say, they're not comforters at all. They just mock me and they provoke me. And really that's what they did. I mean, they didn't just mock him. They could have just mocked him. They were mocking him and provoking him. You know, just when he should be saving his strength. doesn't need to be involved in an argument. They kept provoking him into defending himself. He said, now put down a pledge for me with yourself, speaking to the Lord. Who is he who will shake hands with me? He's crying out to the Lord and asking the Lord to pay his bail so that he can be released from this jail that he's in. Pay my bail. You know, be a, put a pledge for me. Shake hands with me. Become my surety so that I can get released from these things. And he turns to God because he can't trust these friends of his. The Lord is his only source of comfort. For you have hidden their heart from understanding, and therefore you will not exalt them. He who speaks flattery to his friends, even the eyes of his children will fail, will fail. And so, in the King James again, I think it says, he who denounces his friends for a prey, even the eyes of his children will fail. In other words, Job is saying, hey, when, when friends, you know, sell out their friend, you know, and make him a prey to discouragement. You ought to have dis encouraged me, he's saying. And you've sold me out to discouragement. And he says the punishment that is due that kind of a person is, is something that not only ought to affect their own life, but uh, even affect their children. So, you know, Job is getting pretty bitter here. But he, God, has made me a byword of the people. In other words, Job's name became another word for an afflicted person. I mean, if you were an afflicted person, they'd call you a Job. That's kind of how his name was being tossed around. I've become one in whose face 
men spit, and of course they only spit on the lowest kind of person. He said, that's what I've become. My eye has grown dim because of sorrow, speaking of his tears, and all my members are like shadows. He said, to look at Job, he's saying, my body is a shadow of its former self. So used to apparently, you know, be much bigger than he is now and stronger and all, and now he's really just skin and bones as he details a little bit later. Upright men are astonished at me, and and really he's asking that upright men would be astonished concerning him one day when his righteousness comes forth, and the innocent man stirs himself up against the hypocrite, yet the righteous will hold to his way, and he who has clean hands will be stronger and stronger. Job, again, he goes up, and then he goes down, and he goes up, and then he goes down, and he wants to die, he feels like he's going to die, and then he says, here now, when this is all played out, when everyone really sees what's happening, it's going to be an encouragement to the righteous man. When they see that, you know, God kept me through this, I was innocent, and God brought forth my righteousness. So his hope is kind of tossed all around. He said, but please come back again, all of you, speaking to his comforters. uh, Come back to your task of accusing me, for I shall not find one wise man among you. My days are past, my purposes are broken off, even the thoughts of my heart. They change the night in the day. The light is near, they say, in the face of darkness. If I wait for the grave is my house, if I make my bed in the darkness, if I say to corruption, you're my father and to the worm, you're my mother and my sister, where then is my hope? As for my hope, who can see it? And so he's telling them, you tell me that I'm a wicked man, you tell me I'm a sinner, you tell me I'm a secret sinner, and that's why I'm going through the things that I'm going through, and you tell me all that I need to do is repent, and then I'll be delivered from my darkness into the light. And he says, you give me false hope, because I'm not in the condition that I'm in because of my wickedness and because of sin. You say the day the sun will shine, the sun will rise, if I'll just confess my sin and repent. But it can't be that way because I'm not in this situation because of my sin. And then he speaks of you know, making his bed in darkness, talking about being lowered down into the ground. He wants to say to corruption, you know, you're my father, you know, speaking of the body rotting in the ground, and say to the worm, you're my mother and my sister. In other words, he says, I know that's my future, to be lowered in the ground for the worms to eat me, and uh, and I know there's there's no denying it. That's what's going to come my way. I accept it, and it's much better than talking with you guys. And so, you know, that's what he's looking forward to. And then in verse 15, he says, Where then is my hope? As for my hope, who can see it? He has really lost hope. It is a poor counselor who leaves the person that they're talking with, hopeless. We ought always as Christians to be able to leave a person with hope. I had someone ask me at the back door this morning and they asked if there was any sin that a Christian could commit that the Lord would give up on them and and have nothing to do with them uh, over. And I said, no, there's only one unforgivable sin and that's a lifelong rejection of Jesus Christ and the salvation that's found in Him. Every other sin can be confessed and can be forgiven. And, and see, the Lord, just in who He is, he, he gives such hope. And hope not just in this life, but hope in the life to come. And so I know that for us, you know, on the staff as we counsel, hey, if we, can't, if we don't leave a person with hope, And sometimes the hope is repent. Sometimes there is willful disobedience. There is wickedness. That has to be turned from. And then God really will come in, and the day will dawn in following that. That wasn't Job's situation, but it's oftentimes the situation of of people today. And so, But there's always hope. 
There's always in every person's life the ability, and I speak of it with some regularity, but I don't care where any of us have been, there is always at a point in time in my life I can draw a line right across the present tense of my life, and I can't change anything back there. I can't change anything back there. But I do have the ability from this moment forward to obey Him and to walk in His obedience and give Him my obedience to work with. And there's always hope in that. So there's always hope as, as we encourage people in the Lord. There's always hope in Him. Now, hope is something important in life. Every single person has a hope, <laughs> the Bible teaches. The issue is, is it a living hope or is it a dead hope? Peter wrote concerning our hope that we have as Christians, and he said, Blessed be God the Father, be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has borne us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so everyone has a hope. Everyone in this room hopes in something. Everyone in this room has a belief and a hope concerning this life, concerning tomorrow, concerning eternity. People talk and they look and, and, and they act as if Christians are the only one who live by faith. Everyone lives by faith. Everyone believes in something. To not believe that there is anything after this life is a hope. It's a position of faith. Is it a position that's worthy of my trust? That's the question. And so, there are hope. everyone has a hope, but is that hope dead or is it alive? And for the Christian, our hope is a living hope. It's a living hope because of Jesus' victory over death, over sin, over the world, over all of these things. And Peter said that this hope that we have is a hope that we're born into by the Holy Spirit. We're born into a living hope. Hope is important just on a natural level, even apart from the supernatural level, the greatness of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. A long time ago, they did this experiment with Norwegian wharf rats that was fascinating. And, you know, what are you going to do with them? They're about as worthless as cats. <laughs> Where's Jay? There's Jay. I heard him. I heard him. It's, it's fun. I'm just having fun with you. <laughs> People come up and they say, I'm going to get you a cat. They say, you love cats more than that. I know you do. <laughs> So they had these Norwegian wharf rats, and as they were doing the experiment, they would put them in a tub of water, and when they put them in a tub of water, you know, the Norwegian wharf rats, they're kind of, you know how rats are, they got that big body and those tiny little legs, and, and so they try to keep themselves from drowning, and in just a matter of a few minutes, they just go down below the water and, and drown. Fascinating what they did to a group that were in that pool of water is that just before they began to go down, they lifted them out of the water and they, you know, dried them off, took care of them for a little while, and then a few days later, they put them in that same tub of water and those rats that gave up just after a handful of minutes before, now it was almost two days. They swam for almost two days before they gave up. What, what powered them? What kept them going? The hope the hope that they would be pulled out of that water once again. We need to have hope. And we have hope as, as Christians. How thankful I am for the hope that I have in Jesus Christ. I'll tell you, I needed it in my life. You did too, and you do too, if you don't have that hope yet. Verse 16, he said, Will they go down to the gates of Sheol? Uh, shall we have rest together? Uh, in the dust, he's referring to him and his hope. You know, is that where we're going to end up? Just in the grave, enjoying one another's company. And then in chapter 18, Bildad the Shuhite, he answers Job and he said, How long till you put an end to words? And to talk forever, gain understanding and afterward we will speak. And so he said, you know, soon as you're a little smarter, then, then we can talk. You know, it's kind of a thing that, 
um, you know, little kids say to one another. And, and so he said, why are we counted as beasts and regarded as stupid in your sight instead of the wise men that we are? You who tear yourself in anger, he says. And again, you know, this is, Bildad is, he's, he's cruel here. Every time, you know, Job raises his voice or Job gets emotional in his plea, you know, with him it's anger. With him it's frustration, but when they do the same thing, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's not tearing themselves with anger. He said, shall the earth be forsaken for you, or shall the rock be removed from its place? Should the whole world be changed for you, Job? Isn't it possible that you're wrong and we're all right? Is it possible that the whole world is wrong and you're right? Well, in this case, it, it was true. What's it going to take to move you from your position? And then he said, the light of the wicked goes out. Now he's going to describe the uh, a description of the wicked. And again, it sounds an awful lot like Job. The light of the wicked indeed goes out, and the flame of his fire does not shine. The light, of his, is, the light is dark in his tent, and his lamp beside him is put out. The steps of his strength are shortened, and his own cat counsel casts him down, for he is cast into a net by his own feet, and he walks into a snare. The net takes him by the heel, and a snare lays hold of him. A noose is hidden for him on the ground, and a trap for him on the road. And so he's, he's speaking of the fact that the wicked always end up trapped, trapped by their own wickedness. He says in verse 17, terrors frighten him. The life of the wicked is filled with terror. Terrors frighten him on every side and drive him to his feet. He can't rest. His strength is starved and destruction is ready at his side. It devours patches of his skin. Now, remember, he's looking at Job and Job has these huge open ulcers all over his skin. And so he's saying, let's see, now the wicked uh, has big ulcers on their skin and... Uh, 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 has to stand while he's talking because he's covered with boils and he can't find a position to get comfortable in. And, uh, and he's just going right down the line with what he's seeing in Job's life. It just, it just doesn't get any crueler than this with what he's doing. The firstborn of death devours his limbs, speaking of the fact that, you know, he's, you're dying and is, is, you know, again, is, he's skin and bones. He is uprooted from the shelter of his tent and they parade the wicked before the king of terrors. The king of terrors, probably a reference to death. They dwell in his tent who are none of his. Brimstone is scattered on his habitation. His roots are dried out below and his branch withers above. The memory of him perishes from the earth, just like it had with Job. And he has no name among the renowned. This is exactly what happened to Job. He's driven from light into darkness. He's chased out of the world. He has neither son nor posterity among his people, bringing up the fact that Job had lost all of his children, nor any remaining in his dwellings. He'd lost all of his children. Those in the West are astonished at his day, and those in the East are frightened. Surely such are the dwellings of the wicked, and this is the place of him who does not know God. And so, a very poetic way of saying, Job, you're a wicked man, and you don't know God. And so that's what he said. Then Job answers him, and he said, How long will you torment my soul? And how long will you break me in pieces with words? And that's a, you know, he's, you know, he's just pleading for mercy, for some grace. He said, these ten times you've reproached me. Literally, these ten times you have shamed me. Now remember Job, a man of great renown, a man of great power, of great reputation. And I mean, they're just humiliating him. And, and again, shameful. He said, you're not ashamed 
that you have wronged me. You're not ashamed of what you're saying. You're, you're entirely wrong concerning me. And indeed, if I have erred, my error remains with me. You haven't revealed it. If indeed you magnify yourself against me and plead my disgrace against me, then know then that God has wronged me. What's happened here is not my sin. God has wronged me. And he's, he's wrong in this, but that's the, you know, trial he's in. And he's surrounded me with his net. You think my wickedness has been the trap or the snare, but it's God that has trapped me. If I cry out concerning wrong, I'm not heard. I can't defend myself. If I cry aloud, there's no justice. God has fenced up my way so that I cannot pass. He has set darkness in my paths. He has stripped me of my glory and taken the crown from my head. And there was you know, no greater humiliation than for a king to not only to, to fall, but to have that crown publicly removed from his head. You, you know, um, as we watch sometimes uh, where you'll see We've seen in past years where a, a minister will fall and uh, who is world renowned or world known, and and uh, you know is the situation is hard because there's that humiliation that's worldwide associated with it. It was the same thing with a king for him to have the crown taken off of his head publicly, and that's how Job felt here. So this is a humiliation that has happened to me. He breaks me down on every side, and I am gone, probably speaking of himself physically. My hope, he is uprooted like a tree. In other words, it's dead. He's also kindled his wrath against me, and he counts me as one of his enemies. That's not true, but that's how he feels. His troops come together, and they build up their road against me. They encamp all around my tent. And the picture that he's drawing here, is God is not only, you know, trying to destroy me, but He's, it's overkill. If you've ever seen the old movies where the ancient armies would lay siege to a, a castle or laid siege to an ancient city, and they would bring in all of the ground, all of the dirt, all of the rock, and they would build a siege mound against the city so that they could then take their you know, armaments right up against the city and, and take it. And he said, you're bringing out this huge army. You've got all of the people. You've got all of this armaments. You have taken everything in heaven to throw against me, and I'm just a tent. So it's, again, poetic. You're doing this whole thing to conquer a tent. Lord, am I worth this attention? Am I worth what in the world is happening in my life? He said, He has removed my brothers far from me, and my acquaintances are are completely estranged from me. It's at times like this where we really find out who our friends are, aren't they? When he was rich and powerful and had all the palaces and all the flocks and everything, you know, oh, the brothers, they were all around all the time, and all of his friends were there and everything. Now he can't get one of them to visit him. None of them will have anything to do with him. He says, my relatives have failed. My close friends have forgotten me. Those who dwell in my house and my maidservants, they count me as a stranger. And I am, a, I am, I am an alien in their sight. I call my servant. And he gives no answer. I beg him with my mouth. My breath is offensive to my wife. And again, that body just breaking down. And I'm repulsive to the children of my own body. Even young children despise me. And you know how those young kids, they'll sometimes they'll run to anyone. He says, they won't even run to me. None of them will run to me when they see me. I arise, I stand up so they'll run to me, and, and they speak against me. The kids run away screaming. All of my close friends, they abhor me. That's a bad thing. when That's what your close friends do to you, but that was the condition that he was in. And those whom I love have turned against me. My bone, my bone clings to my skin and to my flesh. So he's emaciated and, and with the sores. And I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. And so if you've ever wondered where that phrase came from, it came from the book of Job. Escape by the skin of my teeth. How much skin do you have on your teeth? None. So it means I've barely escaped. And that's what he's saying. I am barely alive at this particular point. 
And then as he's all the way down in that pit, notice he speaks some of the most beautiful words in the whole Old Testament now. And he says, have pity on me. Have pity on me, O you my friends, for the hand of God has struck me. Why do you persecute me as God does and are not satisfied with my flesh? You know, you devour me and and you're unsatisfied because you keep on devouring me. You keep trying to destroy me. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. That they were engraved on a rock. You know, he's, he's going along. Not just in a book. I want my words engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lead forever. In other words, he's saying, I want what I feel to be recorded because I'm right and one day it's going to be proven to be right. And then in verse 25, he says, For I know that my Redeemer lives. No matter how deep the trial got, he never doubted the existence of God. I have great respect for this man on many fronts. And he never doubted the presence of God in his life. He didn't say, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm thinking there's an 80-20 chance that he you know, lives. Or No, he says, I know, I know that he is alive. I know that my Redeemer lives, my Goel my kinsman redeemer, my, you know, the avenger of, of blood. I know the one who will avenge me. The Lord lives. And, and so a beautiful picture really here. He, he dealt with so much less than what we have to deal with because we know who the redeemer is. We know the redeemer is Jesus, the one who has bought us out from our slavery to sin. But beautiful is that hope again rises to the surface, his faith in God. I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another, how my heart yearns within me. He not only knew that God would outlive this trial, and that God would outlive everything, but he knew that one day, though he died, he was going to stand before the Lord one day, and he was going to stand before him in a new body. And he said, if you, verse 28, if you should say, how shall we persecute him? In other words, he's telling his friends, if you continue to persecute me, since the root of the matter is found in me, he said, be afraid of the sword for yourself, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword that you may know that there is a judgment. And so he says to his friends, you judge me. One day you'll be judged. One day you'll be judged. One day you will stand before God in terms of what you have said to me. That's a heavy thing to say. When you, You're pulling out the big artillery there on that. But it is an important thing for a counselor to, speak, to know and to recognize there needs to be that fear of the Lord in order to properly represent the Lord. And so he puts that in there. One day, you know, you're going to be judged. You're going to be, you know, judged for what you've said to me, what you've, you know, done to me. And, and they needed to remember that. It's, it's very needed. A fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and, and, and we need it in, in the sharing of wisdom. Chapter 20. Then Zophar, Zophar uh, the Namathite, answered, and he said, Therefore my anxious thoughts made me answer, because of the turmoil within me. I've heard the reproof that reproaches me, and the spirit of my understanding causes me to answer. The last guy you want around is a guy that talks like that when you're in the middle of a trial. So, you know, trying to wax eloquent and all this. He said, Do you not know this of old, since man was placed on earth, that the triumphing of the wicked is short? Job, what is happening to you only happens to wicked people. And so he's going to beat that same drum. It's like having a drummer living next door that only has one drum. And that's about what they're at. So they just keep hitting that same drum. And so 
They talk about the fact that the life of the wicked is short. The triumphing of the wicked is short, verse 5. And the joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment. Though his haughtiness mounts up to the heavens and his head reaches to the clouds, yet he will perish forever like his own refuse. Those who have seen him will say, where is he? And that no doubt people were asking around town, where is Job? Everything's very pointed with these guys. He will fly away like a dream and not be found. Yes, he will be chased away like a vision in the night. The eye that saw him will see him no more, nor will his place behold him any more. His children will seek the favor of the poor, and his hands will restore his wealth. In other words, Job, you've become wealthy by oppressing the poor. Now you're going to have to return the wealth. So they're calling him wicked. They're calling him a hypocrite. They're calling him an oppressor. Verse 11, concerning the wicked, his bones are full of youthful vigor. In other words, he ought to have a lot more life left in him, but it will lie down with him in the dust. Then he describes, beginning in verse 12, that for the evil person, life ultimately becomes bitter. He said, though evil is sweet in the mouth, and oftentimes it is, and he hides it under his tongue. It's kind of the image of a lifesaver. Though he spares it, kind of nurtures it, you know, doesn't uh, you know, have the jawbreaker all at once, and does not forsake it, but still keeps it in his mouth. Yet his food in his stomach turns sour. It becomes cobra venom. Uh, within him. He swallows down, or a poison, he swallows down riches and vomits them up again. God casts them out of his belly. He will suck the poison of cobras. The viper's tongue will slay him. He will not see the streams, the rivers flowing with honey and cream. He will restore that for which he has labored and will not swallow it down. From the proceeds of his business, he will get no enjoyment, for he has oppressed and forsaken the poor and violently seized a house that he did not build. Well, the comfort continues from these guys. And so now they accuse him of being an oppressor again, forsaking the poor and violently seizing, you know, wealth from other people. But he does, there's an element of truth in there concerning the wicked where he talks about the fact that the wicked will have no enjoyment. And that's one of the things I, I know is such a, as a Christian for me today, I, I get more enjoyment out of a sunset or a sunrise with the Lord or the simplest things in life, just in fellowship with Him, than all that I ever had before I came to know Him. And all of, you know, whatever kind of wealth it might have been or enjoyment or seeking after pleasure, there's no enjoyment. You can accumulate all of this masses of wealth and property and all these things and no capacity to enjoy it apart from the Lord. Verse 20, because he knows no quietness in his heart and he will not save anything he desires. Nothing is left for him to eat. Therefore, his well-being will not last. Speaking again concerning the wicked. In his self-sufficiency, he'll be in distress. Every hand of misery will come against him. When he is about to fill his stomach, God will cast on him the fury of his wrath and it will rain on him while he's eating, and he will flee from the iron weapon. A bronze bow will pierce him through. It's drawn. It comes out of the body. Yes, the glittering point comes out of his gall. Terrors come uh, upon him. And so, uh, who's the guy that does all that, you know, horror fiction stuff that... Stephen King. So we've got a... Nothing new under the sun. Here's the Stephen King of... That era, you know, you know, here you're going to get hunted down and it's going to be a big bronze weapon and it's going to be, you know, thrown at you and it's not only going to hit you, but it's going to go through you and the point's going to come out on the other side of you and it's going to, you know, pierce your gall and all, all that and, you know, just perky little guy to send on hospital visits and, and stuff like that, you know. 
And, and, you know, he's talking about the fact that the wicked, they have a terrible end. And so, you know, you think it's bad now, wait, you know, wait till someone shows up with a spear and really gives you what you deserve. Total darkness, verse 26, is reserved for his treasures. An unfanned fire will consume him. It shall go ill with him who is left in his tent. The heavens will reveal his sin, his iniquity, and the earth will rise up against him. The increase of his house will depart and his goods will flow away in the day of God's wrath. Oh, by the way, Job, did all of your goods go away? This is the portion from God for the wicked man, the heritage appointed to him by God. In other words, the same message, Job, you're a wicked man. This is why this has happened to you. Chapter 21. Job then responds now. He answers Zophar. Now, Zophar's a funny guy of the three. He's, he's, um, the least, he's, he's the blunt guy. He's the, he's like the common man, the blunt kind of person. And so Job has a blunt answer for this blunt man. Job answered and said, listen carefully to my speech. And let this be your consolation. Job saying, I have no hope that you're going to cease to speak for good. That would be a comfort to me. I have no hope that any words of comfort are going to come out of your mouth when you do speak to me. Give me this little bit of comfort. Just stop speaking while I'm talking. That's all I ask of you. And that's, that's what he's saying to them. Listen carefully to my speech and let this be your consolation. Bear with me that I may speak and then after I've spoken, you can continue your mocking. And I don't expect anything else of you. You're in a bit of a groove. So he says, as for me, is my complaint against man, not was against God. And if it were, why should I not be impatient? He said, look at me and be astonished. Put your hand over your mouth. Even when I remember I'm terrified and trembling takes hold of my flesh. Why do the wicked live and become old? And now he's going to completely dismantle this guy's argument. The the wicked always suffer in this life. And that's their proposition. You are suffering in this life the way that you're suffering because you're wicked. And uh, and so the wicked always suffer in this life, and that's their proposition. And so Job is forced to dismantle it one more time. He said, why do the wicked live and become old if what you say is true? Yes, they become mighty in power. Their descendants are established with them in their sight and their offspring before their eyes. Uh, Their children live, their grandchildren live. They live to see them. Their houses are safe from fear. Neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull breeds without failure. Their cow calves without miscarriage. The wicked are prosperous everywhere, Job says. They send forth their little ones like a flock. The wicked have... Uh, you know, a multitude of children, which was a sign of God's favor in, in, you know, in that day. I think it is today too, but they were a little more conscious of it. And so they, they, you know, their, their womb isn't barren. They have little ones as great as a flock and their children dance. I mean, they have a good time. They sing to the tambourine and the harp and they rejoice to the sound of the flute. And those were all expensive things for a person to own. I mean, you had to be wealthy to own those things. And they said, when these guys party, I mean, they break out all of the best stuff to to celebrate with, even though they're wicked. They spend their days in wealth. And, a mo- and in a moment, they go down to the grave. Their death is quick, not like mine. And he said... Yes, they say to God, not only are they wicked, but they're rejectors of God. They say to God, God, depart from us, for we have no, we do not desire the knowledge of your ways. Who is like the Almighty that we should serve Him? And what profit do we have if we pray to God? In other words, they say, hey, we're wealthy, we're doing great, we're doing great without God, and, I'm, and we don't want to involve Him uh, in our lives now. And so Job says, indeed their, their prosperity, indeed their prosperity is not in their hand. And so, um, and, 
uh, let's see, indeed their prosperity is not in their hand. The counsel of the wicked is far from me. In other words, he says, the wicked are prosperous, and they're prosperous under the eye of God. And, and God watches them prosper. He watches them. And, and, and so it's not purely their own doing. God has allowed it. And so if ease and wealth is a sign of God's favor, Job says, then why don't I throw myself in with them? If you're going to accuse me of being wicked, then why don't I become wicked? I mean, I can't do any worse than I'm doing now, but the, the thought of it is repulsive to him. He says, the counsel of the wicked is far from me. I don't want anything to do with it. He said, how often is the lamp of the wicked put out? He said, how often do you see the wicked die in their youth? How often do you see it? You look around the world today. How many wicked men and, and women in positions of power? And you look and say, surely God is going to strike them. Surely God is going to you know, lay them out. Surely He's going to bring that to an end. And, and they, they're, I don't know what vitamin program they're on. They live into their 80s and 90s and, you know, dominate an entire region of the world. And so we're all aware that the wicked don't die quickly. I mean, they hold on to their power. They uh, live very often and maybe even most often to become uh, very old. So they don't die as, as quickly as as these guys were laying them out to say, how often does their destruction come upon them? The sorrows of God, uh, the sorrows God dis, uh, distributes in His anger. They're like, and, and He really continues His question of verse 17, and it's, and it's how often uh, are they like straw before the wind and like chaff that's in a storm carried away? How often do you see the wicked wiped out by God that way? This side. Of glory, How often do you see it? And he's saying, you don't see it very often. But it doesn't mean that, you know, what they're doing is right. They say, God lays up one's iniquity for his children. Let him recompense him that he may know it. Let his eyes see his destruction and let him drink of the wrath of the Almighty. For what does he care about his household after him when the number of his months is cut in half? And so... They, he anticipates their argument. Their argument would be, well, sure, the wicked, uh, they prosper. Excuse me, just ate a net. <laughs> Had to get it out there. It's not bled. Um, so, a kosher. Sometimes they just kind of wander around right here, and I, I'm pulling a lot of air in and out up here. That's why we got this air unit right in, in this air. Anyway, had to mention it to you. Hi, everybody on video. What you saw was me pulling a net of the end of my tongue here in the book of Job. <laughs> Say hi to everyone in Modesto. This goes on the, you know, station. Okay. So he's anticipating their questions there. <laughs> you know, if I was a true Pharisee, I'd have been choking. You know, the whole thing, they, that would have been really, really bad on that thing. And then I'd have to swallow a camel, the whole thing in front of you. That's a gutsy thing. Anyway, so... He anticipates their question, and, and their response would be, well, yeah, sure, the wicked, maybe he doesn't die, but, you know, his, his children uh, end up bearing the consequences of his wickedness. And Job says, well, what good is that? He's dead. What does that prove to him, and what does that prove to the world? And so he's saying your logic is, you know, irresponsible. It doesn't hold up. Verse 22, can anyone teach God knowledge since he judges those who are on high? Does one dies in his full strength, being wholly at ease and secure? His pails are full of milk and the marrow of, uh, of his bones is moist. Another man dies in the bitterness of his soul. He dies suffering, never having eaten with pleasure never eaten enough his whole life to be full. And they lay down alike in the dust, and the worms cover them. What's Job saying? Job is saying to these guys, you cannot reduce God down to these silly little formulas that you have. That the wealthy are always this, and the poor are always this. And the rebuke holds for today. These silly little formulas... 
by which spirituality is determined by outward appearances. They don't hold, didn't hold then, they don't hold today. And so he's rebuking them for that. He said, look, I know your thoughts. Verse 27, and the schemes with which you would wrong me. For you say, where is the house of the prince and where is the tent, the dwelling place of the wicked? Job saying, you talk about the prince who gets humbled. You talk about the wicked. I know you're talking about me. You guys think you're all poets and all that, man. I know what you're saying. He says, have you not asked those who travel the road and who do, who do not know and do you not know? Do you not know? <laughs> their signs. Victory. Got through verse 29. He's saying, listen, you can ask any guy walking down the road. You guys are all the big brains and everything, but you can ask anyone walking down the road and ask them if what I have said concerning the wicked isn't true. And they'll tell you that it is true. For the wicked are reserved for the day of doom. In other words, they may not be judged here in this life. Ultimately, they will, but not always in this life. They shall be brought out on the day of wrath. Who condemns his way uh, to his face? And who repays him for what he has done? Which one of you has you know, gone to a wicked man and rebuked him to his face? People don't do that. They give you know, the wicked man a lot of room. And he says, yet, verse 32, he shall be brought to the grave and a vigil kept over the tomb and the clods of the valley shall be sweet to him. Everyone shall follow him as countless have gone before him. And so he said, the wicked, not only do they prosper in their life, but they even prosper, it seems, in their death. He says that a vigil is kept over the tomb. In other words, when they have their funeral, a lot of people come to it. A lot of people come to their funeral. I mean, they're not even lonely in death. The clods of the valley shall be sweet to them. In other words, they're able to pick the choicest spots for where they're buried. And, and so you go over to the Middle East, or you even go around the United States, anywhere in the world so often, and you'll see where the rich people will oftentimes, powerful people bury themselves, it overlooks some great valley or something like that. And so, listen, I mean, they even get away with, you know, murder here when, when they're dead. Everyone shall follow them in death as countless have gone before him. How then can you comfort me with empty words since falsehood remains in your answers. Why do you continue with this faulty argument of yours? Chapter 22. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, Can a man be profitable to God through, uh, though he who is wise may be profitable to himself? And so, what's, you know, what is the profitableness of man, you know, to God? He raises the question. Is, it any pleasure to the Almighty, he says to Job, that you are righteous, or is it gain to him that you make your ways blameless? And so he's saying, Job, do you think your life is of any importance to God at all? <laughs> These guys, they get it at the end of the book. I mean, it's it's great too. And uh, but you know what's worse? They have to live with themselves after this. And, and again, I go back to what I've shared in previous weeks as one who has said things of equal folly at one time or another. I mean, having done own punishment. And, and again, that's the driving home of the lesson. And so we, you know, we sit here tonight and, you know, we may be down to five people before we get through the book of Job here on Sunday nights. You know, as, as we look and say, the repetition, the repetition, the repetition, the repetition. But there's a reason for the repetition. There's a reason for it, for the point to be driven home. And so the Lord does it. You know, there's a lot of places in the scriptures where I look and I say, I wish the Lord had gone on and on a little bit more, that Jesus had said a little bit more in that circumstance or in that situation, and he, and he didn't, you know. So uh, what he has to say is important, and, and, uh, and so it is in, in this section too. He says, is it because of your fear of God that he repu- reproves you and enters into judgment with you? Is not your wickedness great and your iniquity without end? 
And, and now he says, all right, you want to know what your specific sins are? I'll tell you. You've taken pledges from your brother for no reason. False. And stripped the naked of their clothing. You have not given the weary water to drink. You've withheld bread from the hungry. But the mighty man possessed the land, and the honorable man dwelt in it. You have sent widows away empty, and the strength of the fatherless was crushed. Job, you're an oppressor. You took advantage of the poor, and that's why you're in the situation you're in. Therefore, snares are all around you, the snares of the wicked, and sudden fear troubles you, or darkness, so that you cannot see. An abundance of water covers you. This is why you're in the condition you're in. Verse 12, is not God in the heights of heaven and uh, is not God in the height of heaven and see the highest stars, how lofty they are? And you say, what does God know? Can he judge through the deep darkness? Uh, Job, you keep complaining about the fact that God doesn't seem to be paying any attention to you. That God doesn't seem to see your situation. Well, let me tell you, Job, he sees your situation and he sees you. And when he sees you, he sees a wicked man. That's what he's saying here. Dark clouds cannot, dark clouds cover him so that he cannot see and he walks above the circle of heaven. Will you keep to the old way which wicked men have trod who were cut down before their time, whose foundations were swept away by a flood? They said to God, depart from us. What Uh, can the Almighty do to them? Yet He filled their houses with good things, but the counsel of the wicked is far from me. The righteous see it and are glad, and the innocent laugh them to scorn. Surely our adversaries are cut down, and the fire consumes their remnant. And so Eliphaz returns to his thinking of chapter 15, verse 4, and the whole thing that he's declaring here is that if the righteous can't be assured of the fact that the wicked will always be judged in this life, and that the righteous will always be rewarded fully in this life, if they can't be assured of that, then they're not going to follow God. Again, he underestimates the work of the Spirit in people's life. You know, it's a great book to to read. If you've never read it, Fox's Book of Martyrs, you get an idea of what people were willing to walk with the Lord in the midst of while entire cities and villages. In the first uh, uh, 300 years or so of the Christian uh, church, there were about 6 million Christians that were martyred for their faith. And then to say nothing of the Middle Ages. And so he's returning to that idea. Listen, the righteous have to be able to have these pat little answers. Otherwise, it's going to you know, discourage them. Verse 21. Now acquaint yourself with God and be at peace. It's back to you know, confess your sin, repent, get right with God, and you'll be okay. That's great counsel for some people, but it's not the counsel that is right for Job because he's not in willful disobedience to God. Thereby, good will come to you. Receive, please, instruction from his mouth and lay up his words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty, you'll be built up. You will remove uh, iniquity far from your tents. Then you'll lay your gold in the dust and the gold of Ophir among the stones of the brooks. Yes, the Almighty will be your gold and your precious silver and then you will have your delight in the Almighty and lift your face to God. Everything will change if you just repent, Job. And you will make your prayer to Him. He will hear you. And you will pay your vows. You will also declare a thing, and it will be established for you. So light will shine on your ways. When, uh, when they cast you down and say, uh, exaltation will come, Then he will save the humble person. He will even deliver one who's not innocent. Job, if you just humble yourself, even though you're not innocent, God will, you know, he'll deliver you. Yes, he will uh, be delivered by the purity of your hands. Uh, Chapter 23. And then Job answered and he says to Eliphaz, Even today my complaint is bitter. My hand is listless because of my groaning. 
Oh, that I knew where I might find God. I need Him, but I can't find Him. That I might come to His seat. I would present my case before Him. I would fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which He would answer me and understand uh, what He would say to me. Want to bet? Uh, I mean, when God finally does speak to him, uh, it's a pretty quiet conversation. Job doesn't say anything. He doesn't have an answer for one single thing that God says. <laughs> I can't wait to get to the end of this book. I know you can't either, but I can't do it. I mean, it's, it's outrageous, though. <laughs> that, that's a, what a finale. So he thinks, oh, I've just got to get there and, you know, we'll talk and, you know, talk this through. And, you know, and when he, you know, listens to reason, we'll get this all sorted out and we'll go get a Coke, you know. And, and he said, verse 6, would he contend with me in great power? No, he would take note of, of me. Uh, There the upright could reason with him, and I would be delivered forever from my judge. Oh, if I could just get a hearing before the Lord, then everything would be all right. Verse 8, look, I go forward, but he's not there. So I said, I'm going to go backward. I can't find him back there. He says, when he works on the left hand, I can't behold him. I know he's all around me. But I know he's doing stuff. I just, I just can't pick him up on my radar. I, he sees me clearly. I know that. But I'm, I can't see him. When he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. But he knows the way that I take. And when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. And so Job has this sense that he's being tested. He has this sense that a refining is going on in his life. And there's an old saying about gold that's in the refining fire. And the old saying is that gold fears no fire. And Job knows he's gold. And he knows that this fire is going to reveal him to be the gold that he is by the grace of God. My foot has held fast to his steps. He says, you accuse me of disobeying. I have obeyed God's ways. I have kept his way and I have not turned aside. I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. Not only have I uh, obeyed him and not disobeyed his commandments, but I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. He said, you don't know anything about what I was spiritually before all of this happened. I not only obeyed Him, but I had a hunger for Him and His Word that was greater than even food in my life. Fascinating now. What commands of God did He obey? He's before the time of Moses. He's probably there in in that area of Genesis chapter 9. Probably about 300 years after the flood. Job's probably right in, in that area. There's where, what, what commands? What revelation from God? Probably a reference to the covenant that God made with Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. And then the covenant that he made with Noah in Genesis chapter 9. So somehow God had made revelation concerning himself Uh, through those covenants. It was later to be recorded by Moses, but it was well known uh, what God's standards were and what His commandments were, not in the fullness that it became in the Law and the Prophets and then the New Testament, but there were commandments and there was His Word to be obeyed. But he says in verse 13, God is unique and who can make Him change? And whatever His soul desires... That he does, for he performs what is appointed for me, and many such things are with him. And therefore I'm terrified at his presence. When I consider this, I'm afraid of him. For God made my heart weak, and the Almighty terrifies me, because I was not cut off from the presence of darkness, and he did not hide, and he did not hide deep darkness from my faith, from my face. In other words, he says, I'm terrified of God. He won't kill me and he won't protect me. He won't do either of those things. And yet I know that he is unchanging. It's called the immutability of God, the fact that God does not change. He says, I know that God doesn't change. 
I know he is no different today for all the circumstances that are going on in my life, Job says, than when I was the wealthiest man on the face of the planet. I know he hasn't changed, but I'm not quite getting what he's up to. I don't know what's happening here. And again, a difficult trial to be in. And again, a trial that we so often find ourselves in. He talks about the sovereignty of God, the fact that God is almighty. He does whatever he wants, when he wants. And that sovereignty of God is terrifying to him. We have greater revelation in the New Testament as Christians and as followers of Jesus. Because in the New Testament, we have that confidence that God is you know, sovereign. He is almighty, but he uses his almightiness for our good. Since God is for us, who can be against us? We know that he works all things together for good to those who love him and are the called according to his purposes. And so, you know, we have greater revelation. So he's, in a, you know, a, he has far less promises to hold on to than we have to hold on to, you know, in the dispensation that we're a part of. And so, you know, we leave him in the pit again there at the end of uh, chapter 23, and we'll pick up uh, his continued complaint in chapter 24 as we continue through the book, Lord willing, next Sunday night.